Hey, well, good morning, First Baptist Jinx family. It is good to be in the room with you. Uh, those that are joining us online or in Overflow, uh, thank you for being here as well. If you were here at the beginning of service, you heard us read Ephesians 5, 3 through 14, and that is the text we are going to study as a church family today. Go ahead and open up your Bibles that way. If you're a guest, we are so glad you're here. Uh, our goal uh, is mainly just to walk through books of the Bible as a church family, and so you find us in Ephesians. But that also means you wouldn't have got an email from me this week uh, if you're a parent in the room giving you just a little heads up about today. And so parents, if you look at the worship guide, uh, in the notes section, there's a little footer there that just mentions a little bit about our, uh, about our content today. If there's any decision you need to make for uh, the kiddos that are in the room with you, go for it. Uh, my prayer is that it's God-honoring and uh, just a good day as a church family. So as you turn in your Bibles, and as parents consider that, if that is new news to them, uh, let me tell you a story. Uh, how many of you saw a junior varsity girls game make national news? Anybody? You're like, that's rare. Okay, some of you know what I'm talking about. So just something that happened a couple of weeks ago was there was a team where a player was gone, and so a coach uh, in their 20s uh, decided to impersonate that player and play a junior varsity game. Uh, and she balled out. Y'all, like, there's, like, film, like, and ones and things. Uh, and, and it made the news because we look at it and go, hey, that's, that's not how basketball works. And if you don't know basketball, that's not how basketball works, right? The, the coaches don't, don't play in the game. And, and so this person who I'm sure at one time they were a JV, and then they probably moved on to varsity and then probably moved on, they, they just saw this opportunity to go back and play in what they used to be, except they were supposed to be distinct, Right? Like, her, her job is now to actually raise people up out of junior varsity and through varsity. Like, that, that's their job. That's what they should be doing, not playing in it. And I'm sure you see where I'm headed. You go, this is kind of a weird thing. But this is really what Paul's trying to protect the church from in this text. Paul spent all this time telling the church of Ephesus and through them, the, the early churches of Asia Minor, God's done this incredible work to save you. He's changed you, given you a new identity, a new nature. You are something new, you aren't what you once were, don't go back and play in it. <laughs> You've got a new purpose, a new reason. Don't go play in those things. And last week he said, in this new nature, you're part of a new family. So as a new family, or group participation, get ready, it's coming. We are supposed to walk together in a certain way. We walk in what? Love. Love, nailed it so close. All right, here, we're just going to replay that, guys. If you, if you weren't here last week, it's getting close to Valentine's Day. That's the hint. So the church family, together, we walk in. Oh, wow. You guys are so aware of the Bible and, and of last week. We walk in love. Walk in God's love for us and God's love towards one another. That's how we function. But here's the deal. We aren't the only people walking on this planet, right? It's not just children of the light. It's not just the alive in Christ. That is one category, alive in Christ. There's another category, and it's the category that every single one of us once were, dead in sin. That's it. Two realities. And if you're here today and you're like, well, I just came to church. You just called me dead in sin. Not very kind. Let me just tell you, it's actually the kindest thing I can do. Because everyone in this room who has life in Christ started that way by learning they were dead in sin. So those are the two places. And Paul goes, all right, you know how to live together, walk in love. How do you live as children of the light in a world that's dark? And that's what he exposes. He does it in three different ways by telling us the same thing three times. And essentially what he's telling us is don't take part of what they do in the dark. That's what he says. So that's going to outline our text. It starts in 5 verse 3 and the first section is 3 through 6. But, sexually, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. So that's the first time. If you're underlining or circling, must not even be named among you. Take no part. It doesn't belong with you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, so he explains just briefly, if you didn't know that coveting is a form of idolatry. Because you're saying, I want something for me God said that I don't need, and I've elevated that thing above God. There's a thing that I want that is now deci making decisions for me instead of God making decisions for me. So he says that's, that's idolatry. He says those people who do those things, they have no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So that's our first section. 
Paul says, don't take part in the things of darkness. Now, why does he tell us to do that? And in fact, he says, not just don't take part. What does verse 4 say? He says, don't joke about it. Don't make idle babble. Don't have foolish, corrupt talk come out of your mouth. Don't, don't have crude joking. What? Why? Because they do not inherit the kingdom of God. The people whose lives are identified and consumed with sexual immorality and coveting and impurity, what is waiting for them, no one can tell you otherwise, is the wrath of God. And every time that we as Christians, we live our lives and we step foot into the darkness, you know what? Hey, I'm supposed to be distinct, but I can go back and play. It's not a big deal. It doesn't hurt anybody. You know, it could be fun. Every time we step back into that, we are telling people that are destined for the wrath of God, you're fine. You know, we're just going to put our toe, and we're going to laugh about it. It's no big deal. We're going to make jokes about it. We're going to join in and talk just like you do. And every time that we do that, we are sending this, this message that says, hey, you are fine in the darkness. You don't have to worry about the outcome of your life. Now, now do we believe that? Do we believe that that is the life God wants for anyone? Do we believe that what we want for them is for them to experience the wrath of God? No, but when we live like this, that's what it communicates. So he says it a second time, verse 7. Therefore, do not become partners with them. So there it is a second time. Let, don't let it be named among you. Doesn't belong. Take no part. Now he says don't become partners with them. The words there mean don't jointly participate. Some people have used this text uh, to make business decisions, like, okay, I'm not going to go into business with a non-believer. That's not what this is about. That, that's a wisdom issue. That's something different. Some people use this for, like, the don't be unequally yoked. Uh, that's not what this is about. That's a different text that says that. This is for the church, right? The church, you, you ends, Ephesians. We talk about this all the time. It's this corporate letter. Hey, church, don't jointly participate in the things that they do in the places that the world finds your identity, in greed and impurity and in sexual immorality. I'm going to read this next section. That's section two. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So there's our second section. He says again, have no part in this. Now this time it gives a different reason. Why? Because it's not who you are. You're like, are we really going back to be who you are? Yes, because Paul keeps going back to be who you are. He's like, hey, church, at Ephesus, you aren't what you once were. New identity. He says you were darkness, you are light. He doesn't say you did things in darkness, now do things in light. He says you were and are. If you didn't know, when you come to God through Jesus Christ, he gives you a new nature. That's why I like the light and dark contrast. Because they are distinct in nature. Nobody confuses those things. I don't go to a store and grab a, a, a thing that looks like a flashlight and have to go and say, okay, just curious. Is this a flashlight or a flash dark? I don't want to get the wrong one. Right? They don't sell that. They don't sell something where you're like, it's too bright in here. If only I could not see. <laughs> like that's, and they don't make it because it doesn't exist. They're different in nature. Light is not dark. Light is the presence of light of a light source. Darkness is the absence of it. When we read light and dark, we have to think, oh no, we've come to the light, which is the presence of God who illuminates our life and our understanding and our way. And by the way, that's why I love it. It says that you are light, which means God doesn't light up the situation around you to make it what you want. God lights up you so you can make sense of the situation you're in. And darkness is an absence of that presence of God. So of course people are going to be sexually immoral and covetous, and of course they're going to live in pure lives because they don't actually have the presence of light. They don't know where it leads. They don't know the consequences of it. They don't see how unfruitful it is. You are not that anymore. You have a new nature. And it doesn't go with the other one. So as a new nature, we walk as children of light, which contrasts sons of disobedience, right? So what has brought us to life is different than what gave us our physical life. 
And as children of light, I love that. It's just uh, imagers of light, right? So like my kids are my image bearers. They image their father to people, which is a terrifying prospect because as we speak, my six-year-old is in a room over there in a small group imaging me to people. I don't know what he's saying. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what stories he's telling, but they're like, okay. (laughs) In church, that's us. We've come to God, and we now image our Father to the world. How does the world in darkness know what this God is like? Through his image bearers, through children of the light. So they say, Paul says, hey, guys, walk as children of light, as imagers of God. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Read that again. The fruit of light, so what is produced by God's presence, this is in Galatians called the fruit of the Spirit, It's found. Where do you find the fruit of the Spirit? In participating in things that are good and right and true. That's where you find the fruit of the Spirit. Let that sink in. Okay, so I've got the Spirit of God on me. How do I discover the love and joy and peace and patience? By participating in what is good and right and true. Doing those things, not doing the things that I did when I was darkened and I didn't have God's presence. So he says, put it to the test. That's what it actually means. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The, the language there leaves some room for understanding. I, and I just, I love this picture. And you might say, okay, well, I thought we weren't supposed to test God, right? We don't put, don't put the Lord to the test. Now, what does God say? He says, taste and see. He says, test me and see if I will not be faithful to a thousand generations. He doesn't say, test me by flirting with darkness. He says, test me by stepping into goodness. So what is it saying here? It's saying, as children of the light, this is what we should do. Walk in light. Go over here to things that are good and right and true and do those. Just test God. Have you ever done this? You know what, God? I'm all in. Uh, I've been feeling some tension. I'm just going to go 100%. You said to pray. I'm going to pray. You said to be a part of the church family. I'm part of the church family. You said to use my gifts for your glory. I'm going to do that. You said to forgive people. I'm going to forgive. You said to, to be crazy generous. I'm going to be a giving person. You said, you said, you said, I believe, I believe, I believe, I'm going to do it. I'm just going to try it and just see if it's true. Have you ever done that? Maybe not, because you know what's human nature? Y'all know. Human nature is to be like, all right, I belong to God. I'm going to try and just see how far I can get into darkness without it, like, impacting my life too much. I'm going to try to see just how, like, how far can I bend the biblical definition of sexuality and still feel good about going to church? How far can I pursue greed and having more stuff in my life and let all that God's holding out on me drive me, but still feel good enough to call myself Christian? How many other things can I include in my life in an impure way, but still claim to be God's? That's human nature. Human nature is I'm going to put the jersey back on and go play in the game. And that's not, Paul says, no, 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 have no part. Test God and what's good. Run here, live here. So he says it again. Verse 11, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. That word unfruitful is contrast to the fruit of light. You have fruit of light, fruit of God in your life. And then you have unfruitful works of dark. So people that have the absence of God are working, doing all of these things, and they are fruitless. They do not nourish them. They do not nourish people around them. It offers nothing to other people. What is being done in the dark? Take no part. Now, I'm going to stop there. and we're Actually, let me read this full section. We'll go back. Instead, so we do something instead of taking part, expose them. For it is shameful to even speak of these things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So, what do we take no part in? Works of the darkness. I want to clarify. Because those right there where it says the unfruitful works, you go back backwards in the text. You start to go up and you say, okay, so these are, uh, verse 6, these things that are being done. The works of darkness are done by people that are darkness. They, they, they don't have the presence of God. They don't, they don't know what we know about the gospel. And those people do these things that welcome the wrath of God. What are these things? They were listed. Sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness. Now, now why, why these things? 
Paul doesn't actually tell us why. I can just tell you they consistently show up in his writings. I think there's some good reasons. Maybe the main one is that these are the primary distinctions of every unchristian culture throughout the history of humanity. So, the church at Ephesus is one of the first churches with minimal Jewish influence, and he's writing to them a letter that they're going to take to other churches in Asia Minor, which means it's kind of the first Gentile mission. We're taking this to these other churches that aren't going to have an influx of Jewish believers. This is all brand new to them. What does that mean? It means that they don't have the entire Old Testament known the way other believers have before them. So they don't have the stories of the Israelites over and over and over being asked by God, live sexually pure, and they say, no, nah, I'd rather do it my way. Live pure from your culture. No, nah, I'd rather let culture influence me. Hey, don't covet what they have. And the Israelites, no, nah, we're going to want what they have. Because every culture through humanity that does not belong to God gives themselves to these things. So it defines them. So it's no different today, right? So why does he say live different? Because because these are destructive. These are the things that make up people destined for destruction and destroy people's lives. That's why he says, what are the fruitless works? I want to know, so what are we not doing? We are not being led by covetous. Why? Coveting doesn't fit with the person in the light whom God has met every need. So we are not giving ourselves to impurity. Why? Because, just study the Old Testament. Every time that God's people looked around, they're like, man, we want what they have. We want things that God said I shouldn't want for myself, but I want it anyway. Every time they looked at the culture and they're like, you know what? We worship God, but come on in. Just bring all your stuff and your values. It won't be a big deal. We can all get along. Every time God's people did that, there were dire consequences for God's people in the nations around them. Every time. They're like, we worship God and Baal. Why not? You know what, Molech? We'll just add him too. I'm sure it's not a big deal to sacrifice your kids to things. Just bring them in. And we hear it and we're like, oh, that's terrible. Why would they do that? And then we look in the mirror and we go, how much of the culture am I letting dictate my life? And then this last space, and if you notice it builds, I covet I don't trust that what God has said is good for me is good enough, so I want something outside of that. So I look to the culture. What do they have? What do they say is good enough? What do they say gives them identity and purpose? Well, it's their money, and it's their status, and it's their sexual identity, and it's all of those things. So I must want that. And then it leads you where? Into sexual immorality. I want something that God doesn't want for me. I want what the culture has. And the culture has taken one of God's most beautiful, meaningful gifts. That we're going to get to whenever we study Ephesians, at the end of Ephesians 5. And as with any good gift from God, the culture can take it and take it from a good thing to a God thing and make it a bad thing. And so not just our culture, all of them through history, they took God's plan for sexuality and said, we've got a better plan for it. And they've distorted it. And that's where we live. And he says, hey, as Christians, like we, we don't do that. We stand over here in the good place and we say, all right, God, I'm going to test you. I'm going to believe that the Christian sexual ethic is the best way. God's plan for sex, God's gift, right, which is a man and a woman in covenant co uh, communion with one another. So the gift of sex is to consummate this committed relationship between husband and wife. And it's done so because it images the salvation of God. It images the beauty of God, the creativity of God. It creates this idea of knowing what it means to not just belong to myself, but to belong to another. Union and diversity. And like I said, we'll get this in a few weeks, but, but that's my, it's my favorite description, right? God said, here's my plan. You are two different things, but you are going to come together as one. I'm going to make one out of two. Union and diversity, and it images the beauty and the meaning of God whenever he says, I am distinct from you as a holy God and unholy people, but I have made us one. And he's imaged that in all of creation, right? Whenever you think about night and day, Two distinct things. What's the most beautiful part of any day? Sunrise and sunset, whenever the night and day become one. Whenever you think about sea and land, they're distinct. Where's the most beautiful place to look? The horizon. You think about all these different distinctions and things that are diverse. And whenever they come together to be one, that's where beauty is found. And God said, I'm going to give that to you in marriage. So you remember that I was distinct from you, but I came to you and now we are one. And there's life and joy and freedom and beauty in it. 
because there's commitment in it. So when the world says, you know what, we're going to get rid of diversity, it's just going to be about union. So like just, it's two people connecting, and it's meaningless, and, and it can be anybody, right? Just, the, the diversity piece is gone. So whoever, however, this is where homosexual, homosexuality and the transgender and gender dysphoria starts to attack. And hear me say this clearly, if you're in this room and any of those things have been a part of your life, they do not define you because our identity is not our sexual identity, okay? So if you battle through those and if you're like, you don't know what it's like to have your physical body and then your mental body disagree, that's the story of every Christian. Christians go, God gifted me a body and I'm transforming my mind to align it to what he wants for me. We understand, we, we understand all right? In the same way to say, hey, we're going to keep diversity but get rid of unity, you can have sex outside of covenant marriage because it doesn't matter. It's just something that is done. That that erodes the beauty of what God meant for it to be, right? So so it's it's both. God's plan. And so as as Christians, we step over here and we say, we're, we're going to choose to live in that. Now, so we're not greedy, we're not impure, we're not sexually immoral to have nothing to do with it. This would be a good point to be like, all right, so I live away from the world? Is that the plan? Because I'm pretty sure that what you just described like shapes the life of most of the people maybe that I work with or go to school with or that I'm around. Like That's common, so what do I do? Thankfully, Paul had addressed this to the church at Corinth already, and we have a record of it. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9, he says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. And we're like, right, that's, that's our problem. Like, how do we not associate with them? And then he says, verse 10, not at all meaning the sexual immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. So he's like, all right, so Christians, what's your plan? We're not supposed to be around them. No, no, that doesn't make any sense. You live among them. <laughs> so instead, he gives them clarity to say, what I was writing to you about is not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, if he's guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater or a viler, drunkard or swindler, not even eat with such a one. He says, and what I was trying to tell you is you cannot participate with someone who says, hey, I'm a Christian, but I also am going to live with all the ways that the world tells me I get to live. There's, that person needs to know that they're actually not alive in Christ because their heart is proving that they're still dead in sin. It doesn't do me any favors to say, oh, you're just going to let God, like the disorder of God's world reign in your life, and I'm supposed to tell you that it's okay? It's, the most, it's actually the most hateful thing I could do for you. So instead of that, no, we, we expose it back to chapter 5. So we don't participate in it. We don't make anyone believe that's okay. We expose it. Now, this is really important. Well, I read the text. You go, Let me get back to it. You expose them. Verse 12 and 13 go together. For it is shameful even to speak of the things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. You probably have a period at the end of verse 12, and I would argue that's not a good period, okay? So there's no grammar in Greek. It's left to the uh, translators to decide kind of where to put these things. 12 and 13 should read together. For it is shameful to even speak of these things that they do in secret, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. So he said, expose them. Don't sit around and talk about them. That doesn't help. He says, it's actually shameful to just sit around and be like, oh, those people, those sinners, the people that do those things, you know who I'm talking about. That's not exposing them. He says, rather, when when they're exposed, not just talked about and pointed at, when they're exposed, it says that they get the opportunity to not only see more clearly, they get the opportunity to themselves be transformed into light. The same thing that happened to all of us at one point. And Jesus, I'm so thankful, shows us exactly what it means to expose someone to the light. So what do we do? We don't participate. It's been said three times. Does everybody understand that point? Right? I I feel like I'm beating it to death, but Paul says it three times. Do not do things in the dark. Yes or no? I see the head nods. Nailed it. Good job, team. Okay, we got that. So how do we live among it? What now? We expose it. I want to look at the way Jesus did this. Jesus in John, as described by John chapter 1, verse 14, says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father. Remember, so he's imaging the Father. 
the glory of him. It says, uh, the glory of the only son from the father, and then he says, full of grace and truth. So Jesus exposes us to the glory of the father through grace and truth, both. This is how we expose people to the glory of God. This is how you expose people to the light, is you image the father to people in grace and truth. By what? Dwelling among them. John 8 illustrates this picture. In the latter manuscripts of John, we see the story of the woman uh, caught in adultery. Does anybody know that story? Is this familiar for some of you? All right, so if if you don't know, the uh, Pharisees and scribes, it says that they drag a woman out and they throw her in front of Jesus. And they say, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now let that sink in for just a minute. This woman was caught in the act of adultery. They say the law of Moses says that we are to stone her. What say you, Jesus? Has, is anybody's heart leaping with joy right now? Did you hear that? That you're like, that's what I'm talking about. Yes, expose the sinner. Woo! I, I, I sense none of that from you. Rather, as we said that, I sense this weight of who are these religious people that wait for her to be in the act of adultery only to go in and grab her and drag her out and throw her to Jesus and say, ha, you've been exposed. You could say that's exposing sexual immorality. What does Jesus do if you know the story? He bends down and says that he writes things in the sand. We don't know what. And then he says, you without sin throw the first stone. And here's all the teachers of the law and the writers of the law ready to stone this woman. And it says that beginning with the oldest, one of my favorite phrases, they leave the stones and walk away. So there's some wisdom there. There's the young ones that were waiting until the very end. No, this is how it's done. This is what we're supposed to do. We've, we've got them. And eventually they leave their stones as well. Jesus looks and says, woman, who condemns you? No one, my Lord. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Is there joy in anyone's heart now? (laughs) Do you know what it looks like to to expose someone to the light of God? It was that. It's not railing against the sinner. It's not exposing them, right? The the words that it says in Ephesians chapter 5. It's not speaking of these shameful things. It's not attacking the next person. I can't believe they or, or on your computer or on your phone saying, oh, well, that church or that pastor or those people or those celebrities, I'm exposing the sin. And, and hey, maybe some of you are doing that because you were led that way. Somebody told you that that is how you advance the gospel, except Paul didn't tell you that. Paul said, that, that's not exposing sin. That's participating in destruction. What does it look like? It looks like Jesus being close enough to the sinner for grace to radiate off of him. Who condemns you? Nobody. Neither do I. That's grace. What's his next words? Go and sin no more. That's truth. He did not excuse her sin. He did not rename her sin. He did not redefine her sin. He didn't say what you did was okay or you get to continue doing this now that you're here. Grace says, you are not your worst decision. You are not your sexual immorality. You are not your impurity. You are not your greed. You are not your sin. You are forgiven. You are a new creature. That is grace. And then truth says, you were dead. You are alive. Walk in light. And so following his model, if we are that new creature, that new creation, if we are light now, how do we expose instead of participate? First, you have to live distinct, right? Can't save people out of the game that you're in. We have to live a different life, but it's not so we can be holier or better or those things. We do that because this is the way that God advances the gospel to other people, is that we dwell with them close enough to their lives that they see our lives and they're like, You are satisfied. You have a life of contentment, which is in contrast to my life of coveting and wanting more and got to have more and got to be identified by more. And here you are content in Christ. 
We live close enough that they can observe our life and, and people are trying to find the next self-help. Well, I'm going to add this, and I'm going to add that, and I'm going to follow them and do this thing and then maybe I'll be happy. And they look at you and you're just content. You're happy and you're like, no, I'm, I've just ordered my life according to God. That's it. I'm walking with him. And it reveals the unfruitfulness of where their life is headed. They can see more clearly because of the joy you walk in. Right, the, the goal of a Christian, we're starting to see it. It's not to make light of sin. It is to take light to sin. I'm going to come close enough to you so you can see it now. And that, that's how it works. I'll tell you, I meet with a group of guys every Thursday. They're my D group. We're just um, three other dudes. We're reading through the Bible together. Uh, all three of them are in here right now. Uh, they help me follow Jesus well. I hope that I'm doing the same for them. Um, I'm looking at one of them, see if he says yes or not. I don't know. Okay, yeah, you could maybe. All right. We're having lunch on Thursday, open our journals, talking about what God's teaching us. One of the guys is telling us a story. He was like me. He goes, I took some heat for hanging out with a couple of guys I've hung out with. Their character, not great. Their history, not great. Their decisions, not great. It's like, but God put me in their life. So he's lived among them with this, just this walk with Jesus just this walk of light that's in contrast to them. One of them thought he was a Christian, saw him, and was like, you know, I don't think I'm actually a Christian. <laughs> and now, going from the person who thought he could live this impure, contaminated, live in both worlds life, now that's the person who's taking their Bible on six-hour road trips, and he's just like grilling them with questions. Like, man, I, like, I want to understand this, right? That's what it looks like to expose the darkness. <laughs> For me, it's a new friend that God brought into my life guy that I get a lot of joy from being around, and we're hanging out last week, and he was like, hey, so I uh, was going to ask my girlfriend to move in with me, like we're moving in together, um, except, you know, my grandpa's my spiritual guy that I talked to, you know, and I said, yeah, and he was like, uh, he uh, didn't, didn't like that idea, he was like, what, what, you guys going to move in, uh, yeah. and I said, is that, is that a thing, not a thing, <laughs> he said, my, my grandpa seemed to think it was not a thing, so uh, what do you think, he's like, did, does God want me to move in with her or, or not? And, he, and his next words, he's like, because I want to be right with God. This guy that we, I've been hanging with, like, he's, he's just been growing. He's taking all these, just amazing, like, I want what God wants. I just don't know what God wants. So he asked me. And that was the chance to be able to stand up, and I was like, sinner! Everybody see how unholy he is? No, I'm just kidding. Right? Because praise God, people didn't do that to me. Drag my shame in front of people, like somehow it wasn't them. I looked at them and was like, no, man. I said, God's got an order in life. The world got all out of disorder, and our desires are all out of disorder, but God's actually got an order, and in that order, he says, you commit to someone that you are gonna be one with for life, and you move in with that person to make one home, and that's where you have these gifts there. I said, if, do you love this girl? I was like, well, yeah, I love her. I said, love and security go hand in hand. She can't feel really secure if you guys move in together, but you're actually not committed to her. You're like, hey, we're, we're together, but I could also bail any moment. That, that doesn't make anybody feel loved. So God's plan is the most loving thing that you could do. He's like, that makes sense. So, yeah. He goes, I guess we're either getting two places or getting married. I said, great. Let me know how I can help. <laughs> right? Like, and but it was this moment that God gave me that reaffirmed, God was like, Cody, this is it. In church, this is it. It doesn't say that people are going to be exposed to the light because of what I do on a stage or because of a church service that we hold. It says because you, as image bearers of the light of God, are gonna live all over this city, carrying and being the light of Christ in a distinct way from the world that just that sheds light on people's lives and the outcome of their life. And so we don't make light of it, we take light to it. That's how we live in a darkened world. And it is the hope of a darkened world, Christ in you. So I hope that encourages you and I hope that gives you a lens to see how you can live and why you would live in the light next week. Let's pray together. God, I pray a prayer of gratitude, as always, because I'm so thankful that you called me out of dark. I'm so thankful that you changed my nature. I didn't deserve it. 
I was in darkness, and I'm thankful that there was people you placed in my life that were your light so I could see. God, my prayer is if there's anyone in this room that is still living in darkness, that you would call them out of it today. That when the music starts, they would run to those double doors in the back. They would, they would say, I have to step out of the dark. I need to belong to God. I want that forgiveness. God, I pray that that would go over their hearts today. If anyone realized today that they've been faking it, that they're not a believer, they're still in the dark, and they've been trying to live in both worlds, let them reject it and receive you. God, we pray for movement for the people that are heavy-hearted because the greed and the impurity and the sexuality of this world is so confusing and it's, and it's so unclear with its lines. And God, I pray that today you'd set them free to trust you. And they can know that they're a new creature, forgiven with grace and truth. Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.